Hey, this is Mike Swistak here from Cthulhu Gizzard Customs, and today I'm going to be speaking with Frankie about my passion for painting and sculpting. I'm here with Mike Swiss, uh, sculptor extraordinaire, painter badass. Uh, how are you doing, Mike? All right. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you very much for having me on. Cool. Uh, I saw, I became aware of your work through Etsy, just scrolling. Uh, you know, you type in horror bust, zombie bust, and that kind of thing. And there was, there was your your magnificent work. Oh, thank and, you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. What caught my eye right off the bat was the pumpkin head because that's one of my top five yeah. favorite movies of, of all time. Yeah. Um, but uh, you're from you're from New Jersey, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Born in Rollway, New Jersey, and cool. uh, lived here all my life. Is that anywhere near Blairstown? Uh, maybe a half hour away, I guess. Forty five really? minutes around there. You're in Jason Voorhees country for real. Yeah, 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 yeah. How aware, how how aware were you of that whenever that came out? Being a New Jersey story, was it? Uh, not when it first came out, but okay. as the years went on, I, I I came across realized that it was you know that it might have been somewhat local. Um, but, <laughs> well, I'm I'm from Southern know. Illinois, and so it looked like it was right from the woods and my right in my town. So yeah, when I yeah, found out yeah. it was in New Jersey, I was like. It just struck me as I was like, New Jersey has woods. And then I, because <laughs> I'm dumb. And then I, you, all you got to do is look into it a little bit. And you guys have bear problems and all kinds of stuff out there. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, there's lots of big, crazy city, but there's lots of nice, awesome rural woods and craziness, too. Right on. I, I, I've been in Jersey City. And uh, when my band's on tour, we yeah, were in yeah. Jersey, driving through Jersey City. And we were on the Jersey side looking at the Statue of Liberty, that little park there. So, yep, yep. uh, well, hell, we went to Red Bank. We went to Jay and Silent Bob Secret Stash and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, how old are you, if I could ask? I'm just turned fifty this year. Just turned born 50. in seventy two. Yeah, nice. I I'll be fifty February in February seventy three. Ah, yeah, so, there you go. There you go. So, where did your love for monsters start from? Oh, I don't know. As far back as I can remember, I liked anything monster um movies anything i could anything i could get my hands on you know the old fangoria magazines right. um you know tv shows it didn't matter i i, I just i've always always monster movies sci-fi movies oh loved them all loved them all 70s and 80s were a great time to grow up it was a, a rich environment for tv and movie monsters uh what was did you have a local horror host or was there a certain show or channel that you watched i don't really think we had a cool like horror host type thing um i know we did get was like creature feature was okay. a show that we had on and had like the six-fingered hand come up out of the ground oh and uh, that would always have different horror movies on it i think that was on once a week um so that was cool that definitely helped to see a lot of stuff i also know that you're a you're a rad artist as well Com oh, okay. i'm sure comics were involved yeah. in all that too did you yeah, like that I, I remember growing up a lot of my friends liked superheroes but i liked i liked the house of mystery and i yeah. liked uh creature commandos and uh, oh that was one of my favorite creature commandos uh, yeah gi gi robot yeah and of course, yeah. Of course all the rights anything bernie rison did i thought was the best oh yeah ever. oh and yeah i spent quite a bit of money here in the last 10 years replenishing my rights and collection because i had a massive comic collection back in the day and then i sold it when i got yeah. in my early 20s you start living that party life and everything that you collect and kind of goes away to pay bills so you can be a dork at a bar somewhere so when did you start collecting did you start collecting first toys and oh uh, definitely toys i mean i luckily I, I grew up in a good family where my parents they believed in toys like my brothers and sisters were into sports and hunting and fishing but I was just really always in the action figures, you know, Micronauts like and Star Wars figures and 
Right. I had my, my brothers and sisters 12 inch GI Joes, but then I was in that age where the three three quarter inch ones came out, and right. oh, I just absolutely loved anything like that. Yeah, uh, I was in the I was in the GI Joe. There was a line of Sergeant Rock figures, if you remember. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The small uh, Eagle Force, the metal. Yeah. yeah. Remember those? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome toys in the 70s. Man. Oh, super awesome. I never had the, uh, like the alien. I didn't have that back in the day. Oh, like I, I had the Kenner alien. My aunt bought it for me when I was like 10 oh, years old. And it was like yeah. my prized possession. I just remember seeing the commercial and being like, Ugh. Kenner presents you alien action figure. You from Kenner. I don't want that. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I didn't see that movie till way later. But yeah, yeah. Oh my god, that's amazing in itself. Cool. So when did you start getting into art? Um, well, I mean, honestly, even at like 10 years old, I was customizing G.I. Joe figures and stuff. Like I'd take a pin and heat it up on a stove and put bullet marks in my G.I. Joes and in their vehicles. Um, stuff like that. So from a really early age, I was, you know, taking just magic markers and recoloring things and taking a red Sharpie and making them bloody and stuff. So nice. I'm, um, I'm glad. But, I, the only thing I ever did like that is uh, I took my Mr. T. Uh, I guess they were five inch, whatever. They yeah, weren't yeah. quite six inch and they had rubber heads. So I put a slit in his head and put a machete in his head because <laughs> ah. I mean, back then there was we I, I would die for a Jason figure or any kind of oh, horror yeah. figure like that. And it just wasn't a thing back then. So yeah. you kind of tried to, yeah. I make it made a bunch of victims. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, uh, yeah, the same kind of toy, same toys history. Uh, when did you start sculpting? Uh, when, I mean, uh, I when, did you, when did the artwork become serious for you? Okay. Well, the first artwork that I started doing besides action figures was, I, one of my first jobs while I was still in high school was working at a game store called The Game Room. And they sold pool tables and stuff, but they also sold gaming miniatures. Oh, so that was like okay. my first exposure to D&D and Warhammer and Games Workshop and like and every board game you can imagine a store had. Right. Well, obviously, I liked that. So I ended up staying there for nine years all through high school and college. I worked there. Nice. And that's kind of, I started painting Warhammer Space Marine little lead miniatures and D&D lead miniatures. And that's kind of how I started painting and then how it all started. Nice. So. The Ralph, the Ralph Partha stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I played Warhammer and 40K as well. Uh, I had a skeleton army for the regular Warhammer, but yeah, nice. the, uh, the, uh, the, the 40K, I really loved, I mean, the Space Marines were awesome, but the, uh, how do you say it? Tyranids? Tyranids? Tyranids. Tyranids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the crazy is, aliens. The the warp and that whole thing is just that was just so killer. Oh we yeah. Spent all, that's amazing. We spent all kinds of hours. In fact, I was talking to another guy about it, and I dug these out to show him. And then my daughter's been playing yeah. with them. This is a this is a frost giant from Ralph Partha seventy seven. Oh I think it's wow! The first, yeah. It's the first one I ever bought in like eighty three or something like that. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's that's ironic. I, yeah, I had a, I had a bunch of Warhammer stuff, but again, when I sold my comics, I sold all those cases of those too. But then the figures have come a long way since. Oh, the days. I that's <laughs> I kind of I've kind of started getting back into the. I mean, I I I started out with the Warhammer stuff, but then not long after working at the game room, I found resin model kits. So that totally took me over possessed me been addicted for 30 years but in the last two or three years i started getting back into games workshop because the plastic models they're producing now are like insanely detailed nice. and a lot of fun to build so I, they got me back after 30 years they got me back but i just i remember them being extremely expensive compared to the to the other lead figures and stuff oh, like yeah. I guess they still they were, are. They still are. Thinking. They're they're extremely expensive for like a regular standard plastic model kit. But oh man, I you're, do love you're jogging my you're, you're jogging my memory so much. Like what was the what was the magazine for for uh, Warhammer? White Dwarf. White, White Dwarf. Dwarf. Yeah. White Dwarf. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Oh my God, I'm having a, a nerdgasm right now thinking about it. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Uh, I remember seeing there was one article where uh, Brian May from Queen, yeah. his son was big into Warhammer. And there was an article on his son, and then there was a picture of them playing with, with Brian May in the background. Just like, that's, yeah, that's that guy. <laughs> yeah. So cool. No, so cool. I always loved it, man. I mean, even just like the design and the aesthetic of the Warhammer world, the 40K world. Yeah, that's been one of honestly, probably one of the biggest influences on me and my art. I mean, I've always been into well, that and Giger, but with like the biomechanical and the grafting of human and machine. And right. So love that. I mean, I, I probably sculpted 40 or 50 pieces already that aren't directly Warhammer, but are so influenced with the, the like all of my Mycian coughs are um, like they're kind of it's kind of like an alternate world war ii reality where there's biomechanical stuff going on right so I've done a bunch of stuff like that which is totally influenced by warhammer oh i love that there's a i'm not gonna be able to think of his name there's an artist on instagram his 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 paintings are amazing he does that too it's like it's like world war ii with with the big robots and stuff but there's werewolves yeah. and stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah, Do you, yeah, know yeah. Talk, you know what you know i'm talking about um, I know Ashley Wood does stuff like that, like his the very World War II row buddy. Um, I think this dude's from Sweden, I believe. Like, oh, okay, okay. But I'll send you a link. Hey, cool, you, cool, cool. You might I've know probably who seen it. I'm yeah. just bad with names. <laughs> um, cool. So you did a bunch of artwork for. Uh, what company were you doing artwork for? The first company that I started doing artwork for was uh, Death Inc. Um, it was a little garage kit company, but they were doing some amazing stuff back in the nineties. Like they were, had, uh, Paul Komoda sculpting for them and, uh, uh, who else was sculpting for them? I know Paul did a bunch of the pieces and they were producing really, really nice kits. I was doing like, uh, I was painting up basically displays for them to show at the show to sell the unpainted kits with. And then a very good friend and another person that's really responsible for getting me into the art world, Rich Hilliard, he was doing the drawings for the box art. And then they would have a picture, like a photograph on the box of my paint up of it. So, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. That was, it was neat. It was neat. It was a lot of fun. Got me into both the resin world and painting world. And Okay. It's, did you ever uh, have any of the uh, Kit Builder magazines? Back in the yeah. Day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Kit builder magazines and uh, well, there's a ooh. guy. A guy I end up. I was working at a comic book shop, and we had a customer named Dan Jorgensen. Okay. And he, he would come in and buy comics and buy toys and everything. Well, come find out, he was one of the guys that put out Kit oh, Builder okay. magazine because we got to, somehow we were talking about screaming model kits, and I had yeah. a Mars yeah. Attack. Yeah. And I showed him a picture of it. I was like, I didn't paint it very well, and he's like, You didn't. <laughs> and he's like you want me would you want me to paint it for you and i was like yeah sure i mean yeah sure and then he goes well talk to Keena, the girl in the back so I talk to her she'll show you some of my stuff and i was like all right and i went and then my head just exploded they're like oh my god this is I've been talking to this dude for a year and didn't even know he was he was involved in it at all and he he took it home rebuilt it airbrushed it and that's what really stoked my fire to start painting and stuff was like I, up until then, I was just collecting toys, collecting pre-painted stuff, or yeah. buying like stuff from you, like uh, like like you do. The, you sell them either blank or painted. Yeah, your artwork, uh, the one I bought, the uh, ah yeah, he was so much fun. Man, my lights not working too well. Anyway, yeah, I got smart. this. I bought it. I saw. I, I finally got one and then when i when it came in i was like this is incredible thank you and it, it's it was uh, to be honest my it was one of those busts that it seemed like it painted itself it went so Ooh. fast and then with the hair uh can you tell me a little bit about this sculpt uh was this based yeah, on uh yeah. mason verger or, yes uh, sir gotcha yes it is yes it is yes it is i was always a fan of the of the uh silence of the lamb movies and Mason Verger makeup is just so unbelievable in that in Hannibal. I, I, when I saw it, I was like, "Oh my god, I gotta, I gotta try that." And I'm not, 
like you look at my work, I'm not big on likenesses. Like I will attempt sculpting a likeness of a zombie or a monster from a movie, but you won't see many human likenesses because they're really, really challenging. And I'd rather right. just not do them than do them and have them not look right. <laughs> but I saw that and was like, man, I really got to try that. So the first way I sculpted that was just as the head you see on there, but like as a magnet, you know, it just stopped at the ears. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was just back in the day. That's what I, well, I was doing. I was only sculpting quarter scale reliefs, you know, like basically magnets. Yeah. But I just enjoyed painting it so much that one day. And I mean, I had sculpted that head probably two years earlier than when I produced that bust. Oh. And I finally just said, you know what? Because there was a like a bunch of my busts have come out about that way. My Tar Man bust started out as just a quarter scale head. Um, and my other, the Rigor Mortis one. So I said, you know what? I should try upgrading this guy to a bust like I did with the others. And then that, that was it. That's how the whole actual bust, but definitely influenced by uh, the Mason Verger makeup. Oh, that that makeup is incredible. I love yeah. I love those those pictures of Gary Oldman getting getting done up, and his yeah. his performance was just amazing. Oh yeah, what a, no, he's... What a creepy character, creep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, what was some of your first sculpts? What what did you what do you remember doing first or trying to tackle? How did you how did you get into sculpting, and how was it really difficult at first? What was what was well, the process? I mean, the first time I ever attempted sculpting was I was probably 14 or 15. And it was because I was just so enamored with the resin garage kits that I was collected and addicted to. So that's probably the first time I started. Um, and I was OK, but unfortunately, I'm like very OCD and it's got to be right the first time. And you do it once you do it right. But I had no skill at it. So the first thing I tried sculpting, I think possibly was like an alien from the Aliens movie head. Nice. And uh, it was pretty bad, but <laughs> the first stuff I was sculpting with was Sculpty, where you have mm -hmm. to cook it. So oh. a lot of the issues weren't so much that the sculpture wasn't so good. It was that I would either burn it in the oven or, you oh, know. Wow. And it became a big nightmare. My father didn't like the fact that anything got cooked in the oven after I destroyed it from Sculpty tasted like plastic. <laughs> um, so I attempted maybe five or 10 sculpts when I was like 15 and none of them really went anywhere. And then I just kind of I didn't really attempt any actual sculptures, sculptures after that. But what I did do for years was like fixing mold lines on model kits yeah. And using like milliput, which is like a two part mix in clay that hardens to an epoxy. And that started out just filling air bubbles and holes. But then it went on to me adding details to kits and adding gotcha. things and changing things. And from doing that for 20 years, I guess I actually picked up some sculpting skills, even though I never really just sat down and sculpted any one thing itself. It was always just kind of modifying other things. Then. I don't know, probably. Well, see, now I got a Harley Davidson. And once that happened, then all of the other toy collecting, action figure collecting, model kit collecting kind of got put to the side because it was such an expensive hobby. Right. So I did that for 10 years. Once I stopped doing that, as I mean, I had the bike still, but we just weren't we weren't, you know, going constantly riding and constantly to events. I started getting back into model kits again. And started actually going to model kit shows in Jersey. And then that sparked and brought it all back again. So at that point, which was about 10 years ago now, when I was right about 40, is when I technically started picking up different types of clay and trying to like sculpt. The, the initial thing was to sculpt like nice skulls so that I could use them for armatures. I could mold them, cast them, use them for armatures to do other sculptures on. So that's kind of how it started as I sculpted like, I don't know, four or five skulls in like a six day period. And they were all small quarter scale reliefs. But I had so much fun doing it that within probably two or three months, I decided to do my first 31 heads of Halloween where I sculpt and challenge where I sculpt one head every day for 31 days. And then that wow. was it. It just exploded after that. Wow. Then I couldn't stop. <laughs> That's awesome. So you were painting resin kits 
This oh, yeah. From, always. Yeah. From all the way. I mean, for the 10 years that I was riding the motorcycle, I wasn't painting resin model kits as much. But I was still, you know, I'd like at that point, I kind of went back maybe more to modifying action figures. Because that's kind of when I got into like the 12 inch tall dragon action figures, like the really amazingly done military World War right. II and modern day. So yeah. then the artistic thing kind of switched to customizing them and doing stuff like that. Right. But then once I started doing the model kit shows about 10 years ago, that's when the resin kits came back with a vengeance. And nice. that's when I started sculpting again, you know, like trying to sculpt again, but not just a customizing actually sculpting things from scratch. Do you hand paint all your stuff or you use airbrush? No, I kind of never. I tried using airbrush. I mean, back in the day, after I got out of high school, I went to art school, to college. Okay. okay. So then I used the airbrush and stuff like that. But I never liked it. I mean, I love I have airbrush painted airbrushes that I did on a flat on canvas. But I never liked an airbrush on a on a three dimensional contoured surface. OK. I just as a person, I never liked it. And there's some artists that do amazing work with it. Right. But I just, I never, I don't know, I never liked it. And I think I won, I, I won, I lost a model competition at like a chiller theater show with one of my crazy future model pieces that I painted to a guy that airbrushed his kit. And it just didn't do it to me. Like an airbrush, if you're going to do a female, a sexy female model where most of her flesh is showing, that's the place for me for airbrush. But a lot of people airbrush monsters and aliens and rough things. And I understand why to get that crazy neat fade. But to me, it makes it look too smooth. Like the brushing, the paint brushing of a model kit and the dry brushing brings out like every surface detail that the sculptor put in there. Right. And to me, it just so much, it just services the sculpture so much better than just kind of airbrushing. No, I don't mean to put airbrush down. Again, I know I have a lot of friends that do unmasterful airbrush work right but i've just never liked it never used it on my kits everything is done by hand wet blended and and then dry brushed and inked and you know a hundred different steps but you know, all right. done by hand with brushes yeah that's what i do i'm all hand layer after layer after layer yeah. after layer. yep and then i over layer and then i look at it and then i gotta re redo oh, it yeah. repaint it Oh and yeah, you get, you get better at dry brushing and adding layers, and you look at your older stuff, and then you repaint your old stuff. Oh yeah, it's a oh, never-ending, yeah. just a never-ending uh, cycle of, Ugh. oh, this looks really <laughs> good. Two, two years later, like, man, it's like I my screaming ash kit. I thought I did a really good job with him, and then here lately, I I repaint him. I was like, man, he's pale as shit. He looks, he looks like he needs some vitamin C or something he needs to get out of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that means you're learning though you know that means you're getting better at your craft yeah what are what are some of your favorite uh, some of your favorite monster movies or movie monsters uh pumpkin well, head up there yeah, or yeah. pumpkin head is definitely within got the top three probably i mean that it's such a classic um i mean the other ones you know old school I, I, the creature from the black lagoon definitely one of my favorite monsters perfect perfect design yep yeah. Uh, what's her name? The the lady that designed that. She, oh. did, she did an amazing job. Unbelievable. Unbelievable job. So much character. And he's not just ugly and scary. Like wow. that simple sculpture without his face being able to hardly move at all has so much character. You feel for him. You feel bad for him. You're scared of him. Such as same thing with the, the classic Frankenstein, you know, yeah, the well, Karloff Frankenstein, one of my Jack, favorite creature designs of all time. Jack Pierce was a master, master. Yep. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, one second. Yep. Melissa Patrick. Ah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. If yep, I didn't yep. get her name right, I was gonna feel bad because she got <laughs> she got railroaded by by uh, Bud Westmore and his crew kind of yep. railroaded her and underplayed the fact that she actually is the one that designed that yeah. thing. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, but the Jack Pierce stuff, the Wolfman was one of my favorites for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can never yeah. decide if it was the Wolfman or Creature from the Black Lagoon, but it's it's slowly turned into the Creature from the Black Lagoon because that's a flawless, <laughs> it's just a flawless suit. Oh Good yeah. Story. Oh yeah. I got to meet Julie Adams. She was super sweet. Ah, nice. Did it? Did Hammer play into your? I like the Hammer movies. I, they weren't my favorite, but I I liked them and watched all of them. 
I, I big big Vincent Price fan. Gotcha. So you know, like the Doctor Fibes. I mean, loved Vincent Price. Loved him. The Alien movies. You know, I was I was only was wasn't only hardcore horror. I'm such a big sci-fi fan, especially if it had a monster in it, a sci-fi fan, a robot in it, you know, something neat like that. Right. So the, the um, Alien movies, the Predator movies. The big um, insect movies of the 50s. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Tarantula, them. Tarantula, yeah. them, the Ant movie. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was lucky. My parents got cable early on. So I was exposed to, you know, just uh, tons of stuff, just even on HBO and on basic channels that you never had before. So it was like you could always once we got cable, you could always find a monster, a horror movie, a sci fi movie on somewhere. Those days of not having cable and looking at the TV guide and marking it's, off. It, you knew when you knew when Planet of the Apes was going to be on or you knew when oh, yeah. Squirm, the, the, yeah. <laughs> the man any worm movie or whatever. All those. <laughs> well, that was pretty random. <laughs> but yeah, all those movies. Yeah, I remember my cousin had cable. We didn't have cable where I was at, but he was a couple towns over and they had cable. And he would just, he would call me. He's like, yeah, I watched Conan the Barbarian four times yesterday. And I'm like, ah, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I had to wait. I had to wait. It was on maybe once a year on regular TV. So Yeah. Yeah. No, it yeah. made all the difference in the world. And I've, I've been addicted to television ever since. It's almost a, it's almost a gif that kids these days. They can look up anything, and, and everything. they just don't get the, the struggle was so real back then. Yeah. <laughs> now it's like yeah. I gotta admit I take advantage of that now. Whenever I hear anybody like, "Yeah, hey, I, I really loved that movie when I was a kid," I'm like, "No, oh, okay." I think, "Oh, this is rad." My buddy Pugsy from uh, New York, his, one of his favorite movies from the '70s was uh, "Don't Be Afraid of the Dark." Oh with yeah, the, that's with the little great. demons. I'd never oh, seen yeah. it before. I talked to him about it, watched it, and it's like it just gave me that vibe. It was just so awesome. Oh so yeah. That's a good, good, creepy one, that one. Yeah, and I always mention Gargoyles and The Car. Oh, yeah, The Car, yep. Yeah. I own it, I own it, love it, love it. Let's see. How long does it usually take a sculpt to be finished? Do you zip through them? Do you take your time? How long do well, they take? I mean, both. I do both. I mean, I'm, when I'm doing my 31 Heads of Halloween where I'm trying to do a sculpt a day for 31 days, they're really sketches, you know? I mean, I'm really trying to blow through them quick and get done with them. But on a real sculpt, like what ends up happening a lot of times is I do a sculpt a day and then it gets put aside. And then when 31 heads are done, I'll go back and give it some more love before I actually mold it up, you know, and mm -hmm. usually just to clean it up. But a lot of times lately, like in the last two years, I've upped, I've increased the size of my sculpts from quarter scale to like third scale. Nice. So the third scale heads are substantially larger. So it's a, it's a little bit trickier to get a third scale sculpt done in one day. So usually what I do in a 31 is like I concentrate on getting the head done and as much to look like the thing I'm trying and then put it aside so I don't rush it. And then I'll go back and spend whatever, you know, usually spend another 10 hours on it maybe and add some torso to it, add a neck, you know, really clean it up and get it just how I want it. I would say that like that the... For a reference, the scar tissue bust that you painted up of mine that 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 you showed, I mean that was probably now. Uh, granted, again, granted on that, the face was already sculpted, so I probably put six hours into sculpting the face, and then probably another twenty hours into sculpting the body, the bust, the head. You know, getting everything just right and prepped for molding. So on a, on a bust size sculpt like that, maybe 20 to 30 hours into a sculpt. Do you find it harder to do the bigger size bus? Is it easier to do small bus or is it easier to do the bigger size? Honestly, I think the larger heads are easier to sculpt and get the likeness down on than the smaller guys. Okay. But it really depends what I'm going for. Like if it's just, if it's a larger headed character that I just am interested in the face, then I like doing it bigger. But if it's a character like an alien where I really want to show the crazy chest rib cage detail, then I kind of enjoy sculpting bet more at like a quarter scale, you know, right. just because I don't really have the facilities to mold up larger pieces, you know, with the vacuum yeah. chamber and a pressure pot. So I kind of like I like the biggest head that I can sculpt for detail, but I will go to, you know, a quarter or even like I just sculpted a smaller, like a one six scale head that would be like on a 12 inch action figure. Right. Just a skull. 
But now I molded that up and now I can use that as an armature for doing smaller stuff. I'm working on a sculpt right now called the uh, Seven Souls Engine of Nurgle. So <laughs> it's actually influenced by a Games Workshop uh, 40K Nurgle Terminator armor that has like three little faces in the back of it with all hoses going to each other. So right. I saw this image on the back of a figure and I fell in love with it. So it, if I tried to do it with the third scale skulls, it would just be too large. But by doing it with the smaller sixth and quarter scale guys, it's going to be a nice piece that's, you know, like one of my size pieces, but it'll have seven heads in it. So nice. it really depends. I, you know what I mean? I enjoy like in, sculpting both the large and the small things. It just depends on the application. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> I, uh, like I said, I only paint. I've thought about trying to sculpt, but it's it's kind of like airbrushing to me. So it's like, oh, man, do I really want to. It's a lot of time to put into something. Oh, but it's so much fun. Yeah. Dude, de definitely try it. Just even like get, you don't even got to, uh, so many people are deterred by monster clay is so expensive and all these things. Dude, just, you get basic, the most basic like plasticine clay. You can order it on Amazon. It's like eight or 10 bucks. Play with it. Just play with it, man. Just like what stopped me in the beginning was I was trying to do an alien and make it look just like it looks on my first sculpture. And that's the worst thing anybody could do. Like the best thing that you could do is take a block of clay and play with it and try and sculpt an apple. Try and sculpt something so basic and simple. And then when yeah. you succeed at that, it changes everything. It's not an instant failure and a defeat. And it's not instantly, I can never do this. It's damn, I just sculpted an apple. And that's right. the secret, man. And, and that, and when you look at an object, you look at a human head or something, and maybe it's just my oddness but i break everything down into basic shapes so like i don't ever try to like sculpt a person's head and try and figure out the complex shape of their skull all in one uh, it's like a ball for the top of the head and then a ball for the lower head and then connect it up you know and and start out working with basic shapes and then all of a sudden sculpting ain't nearly as hard and again you can't you can't be critical on anything you sculpt for at least a year. I mean, it's cause it's learning, you know, huh. but definitely try it, dude, because I, I was convinced I could never sculpt nothing. And, and now it, it's my career, dude. It's a business. So it, yeah, it's great. It's so much fun. I mean, there's nothing like sculpting something that actually looks like what you want it to look like. It's one of the most thrilling things. We covered a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about. Sorry about that. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right, though. Uh, yeah, your work's amazing. I uh, oh, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you for doing this. We're about a half hour in. I don't know how long you want to go. No, uh, no, whatever is good for you, man. Whatever you normally do is cool with me. Well, I've, all the information that you've given me is awesome. Uh, I really like. I don't. I don't think I have any more questions. Really, we've kind of covered okay. everything. But I just That's feel like cool. I, I, I don't want to stop the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I really, uh, I guess we'll 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 call it. This is a good link. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, oh, thank you, Frank. Uh, this was awesome, man. Obviously, Etsy uh, and your Instagram are ways for people to see your work. Yep, yep. I'll make sure yep. that both of those links will be in this video. Awesome, uh, cool. Yeah, so, Cthulhu uh, Gizzard on Etsy, and then Cthulhu Gizzard and Mike Swistak on Instagram. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you too, I'll, Frankie. Thank you. Take care. All right, brother. Have a great one, man. Bye bye. Peace. Bye. There's a few of the things in my shop here.